in this medical apps masterclass we are going to learn about diabetic nephropathy now when i talk about diabetic nephropathy the most important point you have to remember that it is one of the most common cause of ckd which means diabetic nephropathy is the most common cause of chronic kidney disease not only that it is also the most common indication for renal transplantation so both these points you have to remember when we talk about development of nephropathy in a diabetic patients it's basically dependent on two factors number one how good is the control or how bad is the control and what kind of diabetes it is for example if the hba1c is more than seven which means a poor control of diabetes then the development towards diabetic nephropathy will be faster second you know the type of diabetic type one diabetic patients are you know prone to develop diabetes nephropathy much faster than your type 2 patients for example typically a type 1 patient with poor control remember all these is related to the diabetic control with poor control type 1 diabetic patient can progress to nephropathy in as early as 5 years whereas type 2 diabetic patients will take around 15 20 years to get into diabetic nephropathy so this is very very important and why nephropathy even your retinopathy diabetic retinopathy almost every type 1 diabetic patients will develop retinopathy very very soon whereas not all your patients of type 2 diabetic and uh, you know mellitus will get into retinopathy so type 1 diabetic patients very early they get into nephropathy and type 2 will take a little longer time to get into nephropathy and it all depends upon how good your glycemic control is so as a doctor your aim should be to keep the hbmc less than seven now when i talk about this diabetic nephropathy it generally presents as a bilateral uh, bilateral enlarged kidney when you do an ultrasonography all these nephropathy patients they will start showing enlarged kidney so one of the most common you know questions which is asked around this is what is the differential diagnosis of a bilaterally enlarged kidney so these are the five most common causes of your bilaterally enlarged kidney hiv associated nephropathy polycystic kidney disease, amyloidosis, diabetic nephropathy and hydronephrosis. So these are the five very very important and very common causes for bilaterally enlarged kidney. Now remember in all these cases the enlargement is not followed by pain. So all these are painless bilaterally enlarged kidney. On a side note very frequently you can be asked about the cause of a unilateral but painful enlarged kidney and the correct answer would be renal vein thrombosis. So again you know when you do an ultrasound for a diabetic patient you will find bilaterally enlarged kidney but again all end stage renal disease will ha finally have a shrunken kidney so again this is very very important all end stage renal uh, uh, you know uh, disorders all end stage renal chronic kidney disease patients will have bilaterally shrunk kidney but when the patient is presenting to you and when you get an ultrasound done you will get a bila bilaterally enlarged painless you know kidney another very important thing which you have to remember is that as the disease progresses as the disease you know moves into the end stage uh, renal disorder you will have in all these cases not only in diabetes in all the end stage renal uh, you know kidney disorders you will have bilaterally shrunk kidney so having understood that let's look how do we diagnose diabetic nephropathy so one of the most important uh, you know test which we do is albumin excretion ratio so basically it is measured in milligram per minute so what we do is we collect 24 hours of urine okay and we see how much albumin is there so whatever amount of albumin is there we take that albumin and divide it by 24 into 60 so that we get the albumin excretion rate of milligram per minute so this is one of the very good screening tests for diabetic nephropathy but you remember you have to collect the urine for 24 hours get the total amount of excreted albumin in that 24 hours and then divide it by 24 into 60 so that you can get an albumin excretion rate in milligram per minute so this is one of the very good screening uh, tests for diabetic nephropathy but again it requires 24 hour of urine so another very important test is a spot urine albumin ratio creatinine ratio so what happens here is you take a spot sample and then you see the total amount of albumin in milligram and total amount of creatinine in the urine in gram so in the spot sample which means in a single sample you see how much albumin is there and how much creatinine is there albumin is you know measured in milligram and creatinine is measured in gram and this what gives you is a spot urine uh, albumin creatinine ratio again 30 to 300 is you know uh, a diagnostic of a moderate moderately increased albumin here so this is the second uh, you know test for your screening of diabetic patient a third 
more commonly you know which patients will be coming to you is serum creatinine now remember serum creatinine is a specific for marker for diabetic you know nephropathy but it only starts rising you know when the you know when there is almost 60 percent damage so you don't have to wait for your patient's serum creatinine to increase you know you should either go for an albumin excretion ratio or a spot urine albumin creatinine ratio even before you know if your patient is diabetic he is having poor control or otherwise also you should get this spot urine albumin creatinine ratio or albumin excretion ratio to determine even in the pre nephropathy stages again uh, most of these patients generally don't, uh, uh, for diabetic nephropathy you generally do not require any kind of biopsy but again there are some biopsy or pathology related uh, questions which you may be asked so when we talk about renal biopsy we never do a renal biopsy to diagnose diabetic nephropathy but again we uh, for academic purposes we should know that what kind of renal biopsy changes are there so the most specific change for a, a diabetic nephropathy which is seen on renal biopsy is nodular glomerular sclerosis i will show you you will learn more about this in pathology but i'll show you the pathology slides this nodular glomerular sclerosis change is called as kimmelstein wilson disease this is one of the most specific changes for diabetic nephropathy when you do a biopsy the most common change however is diffuse glomerular sclerosis so nodular glomerular sclerosis is most specific change whereas diffuse glomerular sclerosis is the most you know common change which is found in the renal biopsy a third very important change again i'm going to show you a slide for this is armani epstein change this is seen in the proximal convoluted tubule i'll show about this change and last very important is development of type 4 renal tubular atherosclerosis because of the damage to the distal convoluted tubule so these are the four findings on a histopathology level which you will see in diabetic nephropathy patients let me show you the slides so this is what you see is a you know a nodular glomerular sclerosis also called as kimmelstein wilson disease so you can see this you know high line deposits you know high line deposits so this is your you know one of the most specific finding in a diabetic patients when you do a biopsy right the second is basically armani epstein change so basically here what happens you can see these cells specifically these cells if you see you know there is subnuclear vacuolation of the proximal convoluted tubule and this subnuclear vacu vacuolation is basically because of your this subnuclear vacuolation is basically deposition of glycogen in your proximal convoluted tubule so this change is basically called as armani epstein change again this is very very specific to your diabetic nephropathy let's talk about the rt so we know that in diabetic nephropathy there is a development of aldosterone resistance now this aldosterone is very important for your enac or sodium channel epithelial sodium channel so what does this channel do so let's say you know this is your distal convoluted tubule and this is your enac sodium channel okay epithelial sodium channel so it has what it will do is it will pump in it will pump in your salt and water and it will pump out it will pump out your potassium and hydrogen ion. so let's look at what will happen so because it is not able to this you know this channel is now not functioning okay there is aldosterone is what will be acting on this channel so there is an aldosterone resistance which means this channel will not be doing its work so let's look at what will the function because salt is not being absorbed so there will be salt wasting number one feature they will be salt wasting number two because water is not being absorbed right so there will be polyuria there will be polyuria okay now let's look at because hydrogen ion is not being excreted out so there will be metabolic metabolic acidosis because hydrogen ion is not being excreted so there will be metabolic acidosis and because potassium is not being excreted so there will also be hyperkalemia so these are the four very very important findings in your diabetic patient so there will be salt wasting there will be polyuria there will be metabolic acidosis because hydrogen ion is not being here and there will be hyperkalemia what is the type of rta we call it we call it as a type 4 rta there will be a separate lecture on all the different types of rtas okay and what are their you know major differences but remember in diabetic nephropathy you will have type 4 you know renal tubular acidosis acidosis because you can see here that hydrogen ion is not being able to pump out because it will be repaint it will lead to acidosis now a very very particular mention about this hyperkalemia now what is the drug of choice for diabetic nephropathy we know that ace inhibitors 
or ARBs are the drug of choice okay because they delay the development of diabetic nephropathy and what is the most common side effect of these they are also called hyperkalemia now both of these the RTA which is in the diabetic patient as well as if we use this you know ACE inhibitors or ARBs for these patients to slow down the diabetic nephropathy what is going to happen you can have you know huge amount of hyperkalemia okay so when you are using ACE inhibitors in these patients you have to you know continuously you know keep monitoring at regular intervals for the development of hyperkalemia because even you know such high level of you know potassium or such a high level of potassium can lead to cardiac arrest, uh, cardiac arrest. because what will happen you know because of the hyperkalemia the cardiac muscles will not be able to you know uh, you know expand they will not be able to contract so there will be a cardiac arrest in diastole so we can talk about it in when we are going to learn our cardiology lectures but remember hyperkalemia can cause you know cardiac arrest in diastole so when you are patient when you are suspecting diabetic nephropathy or your diabetic patients when you are starting on ace inhibitors make sure that you get regularly whenever they come for your follow-up you get their potassium level done so this is about your nephropathy so having understood the nephropathy and what are the changes let's look at how the patient will present so the first few years that is first five years there will be glomerular hyperfiltration glomerular hypertrophy so there will be actually a paradoxical increase in the gfr there will be an increase in the gfr but eventually after 5 to 10 years there will be albuminuria which will you know which will be primarily due to the irreversible damage and it is basically coinciding with your cvs mortality Remember, when you are looking at albuminuria, you should always rule out the false, you know, positive, you know, causes of albuminuria. For example, hypertension, uh, congestive heart failure, pyelonephritis. So all these are very, very important, you know, false positive for albuminuria. So make sure that you, you know, kind of rule out these. But eventually, what will happen? Other diabetic complications will start setting in, like hypertension, non-healing ulcers, retinopathy peripheral vascular uh, occlusive disorders so first five years there is uh, glomerular hyperfiltration and hypertrophy this is primarily the reversible stage but once you know after five to ten years of poor control the patient will progress to albuminuria and which is primarily saying that there is irreversible damage and eventually the cardiovascular mortality may increase and uh, you know when you are looking at albuminuria make sure that you differentiate it with false albuminuria cases like in hypertension chf pyelonephritis and as the patient progresses after 10 to 15 years along with glomerulonephritis or along with diabetic nephropathy you will have hypertension non-healing ulcers retinopathy which means the entire you know complications of diabetes will start setting in so having seen the progression of diabetic nephropathy let's look at you know the management of diabetic nephropathy now remember whenever in a diabetic nephropathy patient you have to stop metformin and sulfonylurea because both of them both these classes of drug they are very wonderful but they tend to decrease the gfr further so you have to stop metformin and sulfonylurea there are two drugs oral drugs which are however very very useful one is glipizide and one is linagliptin both of them are very useful and they can be safely given because both of them are metabolized in liver and do not affect the gfr so they can be given in diabetic nephropathy patient glipizide you know can be given in two to three doses at 80 milligram or 40 milligram you know per dose okay whereas linagliptin is given as an od dose at 10 milligram so these are two safe drugs which you can use in diabetic nephropathy patient the you know we have seen that diabetic nephropathy development depends upon the control of diabetes so a good idea would be to initiate insulin a little early so that you can get a good glycemic control but remember when the gfr is decreasing okay you have to use 80 percent of the calculate dose which means you have to titrate based on the gfr so because the insulin tends to remain longer in the body so you can get 80 percent of the calculated dose for these patients so these are the two important things again you have to make sure that the you know uh, the bp is on the lower side 130 to 80 remember toleration of the patient is very very important because sometimes when the patients need a little higher uh, you know they cannot tolerate low bp so you have to keep this bp as low as 132 by 80 and one of the drug of choice is ace inhibitors or arps so this you will choose but as told you that these drugs may cause hyperkalemia because of type and um, this hyperkalemia can be compounded by already a type 4 rta you know uh, induced hyperkalemia so you have to have a very very close look at the 
uh, potassium level of the patients having said that if the hyperkalemia is there there are some ways by which you can manage it you can use a potassium binding resins like sodium polystyrene sulfate you can use pyrometer or you can use sodium zinconate psychosilicate uh, that is zs9 so these are the uh, you know important um, you know paradigms in treatment of diabetic nephropathy and the last point about management of diabetic nephropathy is if the gfr falls below 20 that is if the gfr is below 20 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square then this becomes an indication for uh, you know transplant for renal transplant in diabetic nephropathy patients so this was asked as a exam mcq point that what is the indication for transplant in a diabetic nephropathy patient the uh, answer was less than 20 g uh, you know mill, uh, gfr of less than 20 so having understood that remember for all your diabetic patients glycemic control forms the cornerstone of management and you have to target to keep the hp1c below 7 so that nephropathy is delayed Having said that, this concludes our discussion on diabetic nephropathy.